we want to make sure that we can pick up on all the audio. So once we have a little bit of discussion going on here, if you have something that you would like to share, it's, uh, share with everybody. If you have questions you'd like to ask, make sure that you just go ahead and push the button on the mic closest to you so we can pick that up for our recording. Uh, Otherwise, uh, I am very pleased to introduce our speaker. We have Laura Widener here from Global Campus. She's an instructional designer, and she has some excellent tips and tricks about getting set up and teaching in an online environment. So please help me and welcome Laura. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, so I'm here to talk to you a little bit about teaching online. Um, please pardon me while I advance the slides from two different locations because my notes didn't print, of course. So we're just gonna go through this together. There we go. Um, my name is Laura Widener. I am an instructional designer for K-State Global Campus. Um, we are sort of in charge of the online courses here at K-State in terms of helping with the process, but all of those courses belong to the colleges. So we partner with the faculty in making sure that their content is presented in the best way um, for online students. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that process and about some of the skills that are really strong for being an online teacher and some of the statistics out there as well. So let's talk a little bit about faculty attitudes toward technology. There's a study that just came out uh, last week, I think, and so perfect timing for this talk. I was able to update my um, data. So 46% of the faculty that they polled have taught online. It's actually a little bit higher for public universities. It's 49%. And that is significantly increased from, I think it was 2013. It was only at about 30%. So we're seeing that that is growing and growing faculty are expected to teach online more and more. 41% of those that are teaching online have been teaching less than five years though. So it's very new for all of us in what it means to teach online and how it's different from teaching in a campus environment. And so there is a lot of skepticism as to whether or not teaching online will produce similar or even better outcomes for students. So we'll talk about that a little bit. In the study, they polled everyone about their views on whether online courses can produce equivalent outcomes. Only 14% of those that have never taught online felt that it produced the same outcomes. But those that have taught online, 61% felt that it had the same outcomes still not as high as I'd like it to be. We want to show that they are exactly equivalent. But there's a lot of question and, and uh, uncertainty about the online environment. So hopefully we'll be able to talk through a few of those types of things today. So I will not deny that there are challenges in teaching online. So I'd like for us to talk a little bit about some of those challenges and some of the worries that you have about teaching online. So does anybody have anything? First, who's taught online? I see your hands, seeing about five hands. Okay, that's about a third of our audience, maybe even just a fourth. All right, how many of you have been approached about teaching online and been like, oh, I don't know about that? Or how many of you have taken an online course? A few more hands, okay. What are some of the concerns that you have about online teaching? I know all of you have probably had a bad experience in an online class. There's mics everywhere. Go ahead and press the mic. Yeah. Thanks. Um, a possible kind of concern is keeping the students engaged. I know there's some classes that have you read and do discussion posts and then the instructor posts the video. There's some where they post the lecture video in the first place and just kind of how to start, how to go about it to make sure to assure the most engagement. Excellent. Yes. Engagement is definitely the top concern. Uh, let's get you a microphone from over here. <laughs> So I've taken only one online course and okay. I was very skeptical about taking online classes. I thought like online education is like, it's not good at all. Uh -huh. But after I taken the class, I was uh, surprised. I mean, good. 
pleasantly. My concerns were also like, (laughs) hey, kind of like someone else can read it and do it for you and all those kind of things. I thought, but, um, and I also thought it was just about reading and doing message boards, Mm -hmm. but it was a lot of different things. And I, um, because of that class, I feel like I would like to teach online as well. Excellent. I'm so glad to hear that. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, last year I was trying to teach online and I, I read this couple of challenges. Uh, one of them was uh, network issues and I was trying to connect with the students. Another was the language barriers. The, I did not know the, the native language of the international students. So these, these are two major challenges when I started teaching. Okay, great point about language barriers and time zones and location of people. I mean, you can have students all over the world. You know, we have some students in um, one of our programs that are in like Taiwan, you know, and the time difference trying to connect for synchronous sessions with those students, it's very challenging, right? So there are a lot of challenges. Okay, well, let's talk about one of them that came up in the study a lot or in a couple of different studies that I've looked at. From the faculty's perspective, a bigger time commitment to create a course or to teach a course. And that is true. I'm not going to deny that. And that's where instructional design can really come in and help because we have a lot of the training in the structure and the processes of teaching online. But this particular study, Freeman found that the faculty um, polled felt that the first time they taught the course, about 70% of them um, felt that it took them significantly more time to teach the course. But by the third time they taught that course, only 18% felt they were taking more time to teach that course. So it's also thinking about the first time you taught any other course. It probably took you a long time to get ready for that course, to create the content, to create your lectures, to be ready for that course. So it's also that familiarity once you've been teaching a course on campus, you've got your notes down, you know what you're doing, right? And so um, you're, you're very comfortable in that. You're having to almost start over again in the online environment. So we get that. And so instructional designers try and help alleviate some of that process. We'll work one-on-one with faculty to really help them get through some of the content and really help um, get it ready for the course. One of the things that we always recommend is that you prepare ahead of time. It can take up to 100 hours to create an online course. That's a lot. No, but if you think about the time that it takes that you spend in your online or in your on campus course, it's probably not that different. You want to work ahead though. This is not a situation where you can start in the first week and build your first um, lecture and be ready for a Thursday to, to go into class. You have to be prepared ahead of time. And hopefully you're prepared for the entire semester, which is also a different concept and way to start thinking about your course. You want to have everything laid out beforehand so you're not scrambling to be prepared that week. You can do it. I have faculty that I work with that do that. And there are some times that you do want to have that flexibility, especially if you, if you have a concept that really is tied to current events, you're going to want to be prepared on the fly to change with what the current events are going on, you know, and throw in something that's happening right now. But the structure and the process, you want to make sure that you're ready ahead of the course. So creating community. That is one of the biggest issues that faculty talk about or concerns that they have with um, creating or being an online teacher. It's also about your presence in the course and making sure that the students feel that you are there. Online students often feel isolated. They don't really feel that connection with each other or with the faculty member. And so it's important that you do a couple of different things to help them with that. You need to manage the expectations. Some online students are expecting you to be available 24 seven. You don't have to be available 24 seven. Just like you aren't on campus if they send you an email at 11 p.m. when they're doing their homework, it's okay if you get to it the next morning. Don't feel pressured by their schedule. 
but some of them have that expectation. So communicating with them up front and saying, these are the hours that I'm available. These are my virtual office hours. You're welcome to connect with me then. I'm happy to take emails and respond, those kinds of things. But you also have to really show that you are present when you are focusing on that class. And that can be through participating in discussion boards. That can be through comments or um, feedback that you give on assignments. That can be through announcements that you place throughout the course. There are ways for your students to know that you really are engaging. It is not okay to put your lectures up there, grade a few assignments, and forget about it, right? You wouldn't do that in your normal classroom either. You have students come up to you after lecture, right? and ask you questions, or they're leaning over to the student next to them. Wait, what did she say? What are we supposed to turn in next week? You have to create those opportunities in your online course too that will hopefully cut down on the number of emails that you have to receive if that communication is going on between your students. So being frequent with your instructions, with your announcements, but also concise. You don't need to write really long things. I believe that um, students really have challenges with reading nowadays, and we all do. We're in, a, we're in sort of an overload of information right now in society. And so we skim, and we absorb, and we reference back to things, but we don't necessarily read for details. So shorter is better. <laughs> Um, and using an automated feedback system really is okay if you've got a personal touch. So figuring out a system that works for you where you're saving comments that you might use for students and using those again so you're not typing everyone out every single time, but then offering that little bit of a personal touch to it as well. And then being the facilitator of learning, not so much, I'm sure you've all heard, the sage on the stage, right, but instead the guide on the side. And how do you help them navigate through the materials, but really capture the learning for themselves? It's a tricky balance. Making sure that the students are connecting with each other really can help you manage your workload as well. If you have designed your course for interaction, and you're right, not just discussion boards, read and post, read and post gets really old. We want to engage them in the content more than that. So what could you do that's a little bit different? Could they do a presentation? Could they take pictures? You know, things like that, that really help them connect with the environment and connect with each other. One of our colleagues here on campus does the basic nutrition course. She has them take a picture um, for their introduction of their food environment. So of their kitchen or their kitchen table or their refrigerator, something like that. So they're sharing their environment, even though they could be miles and miles away from each other. Tell them the purpose of the things that you're doing with them. Again, this isn't a bad practice to have in your campus class, right? But it's almost essential in an online environment. They need to know why. They do not like busy work. Busy work doesn't do them any good. So why is it important that they have this discussion board? What is it you're trying to get them to get to? Why is this going to improve their learning? Spell it out over and over and over again, all your instructions in several different places, you know, because we all navigate online a little bit differently. I had a great discussion with another professor. He polled his students before teaching online. He was using, um, the LMS Canvas um, with his campus students, right? Just as the blended environment. And he asked them how he was they were accessing the information. And so I'm sure you've all seen Canvas that you can set it up in modules and he had all of his information set up in great modules. And someone said, well, I just go to the calendar and click on the assignment. I've never been in the class. So he set all this information up that that student had never seen. So how important it is it that he duplicated the instructions or the materials right in the assignment itself. So when the student went to submit, they also saw the learning materials right there. That was a huge eye opener for me and I'm an instructional designer, you know, I should know that. <laughs> but you never know how students are going to access that information. 
So tell them a million different ways in a million different locations, and then it's there, and you don't have to do it again. Um, and let those students lead. We have several different faculty that will guide discussions in the first couple of weeks, but then turn it over to the students to come up with the discussion question. And you'll find that in reality, if you're giving them that leadership, if it's their responsibility, those discussions can be much richer than when they feel they're just reporting to a faculty member. They start to interact a little bit better. They start to really engage with what each other are thinking and how they can build that knowledge. And it's tricky to set up, but an instructional designer can help you do that too. All right, so this is a fun video. We'll see if we can get it started kind of on the lines of the discussion board and some of the issues that we have sometimes. Let me see if this works. That's not good. Oh, darn it. Can you get it going? <laughs> Right after I finish writing words, I'm gonna eat pie. I, I need pie. I would have migrated to colonial America because I would seek freedom from oppression. I wouldn't have migrated because the abandonment of family would have forbidden me from such an act. I agree. I agree. Thanks. I believe I need more information before I can reasonably respond, huh? Where am I from? What social demographic do I come from, huh? Five minutes left, it's time This is my chance to shine I believe the color yellow is used to represent cowardice I thought that the color lemon was used to represent a lack of bravery I believe that's what I just said, Carrie Wow, great insight! I would have never thought of this! I agree! It reminds me of a time in my life when I was in a similar situation as King Richard just great comments. Great. You guys are so awesome. I learned so much. Good point. I wouldn't want to be doing anything else in the whole wide world. I agree. Smiley face. LOL. That was awesome. Ace for everyone. Great comments. Sorry I'm late. I had a thing. But for obvious reasons previously stated, I want to migrate it. I agree. There's apple pie and chocolate pie and lemon pie and pumpkin. Okay. <laughs> I hope you found that funny. What's wrong with this? What are the issues with this discussion board and how could we 
counteract this and make the discussion more effective. Come on. Yeah, go ahead. People, people are just trying to get in comments for credit and there's not necessarily any engagement or interaction. Mm -hmm. They're just putting it in for credit. Can you pass the mic down? It's not really natural language. Online language is different and you have to build the vocabulary and talk about etiquette when you have your online language. Good. I like that. That's a great point. Yeah. So um, there was no prior information was given, no purpose, like why are they supposed to answer, uh, what are they doing, so it's almost like nobody knew why are they doing it, like he said, just for credit, but no other um, uh, reasoning behind it, so right. no, nobody cared. Kind now of that like might have been somewhere in the module before, Yeah, but, but can you imagine walking into your classroom, writing something up on a board, having a seat, and then just waiting? Would that work? Probably not. Huh. Anything else? How many people waited until the last five minutes, right? <laughs> we have, you have a couple of people that will pop up right away. Then they have nothing to say to anyone else because no one else has actually said anything. So that's kind of an issue. How many people said, I agree. That's a great point. Good job. <laughs> that's not meaningful discussion, right? That's not really growing their knowledge. Then someone said, the color yellow is meant for cowardice. What did that have to do with the prompt question, right? So lots of different problems with the way that this discussion board was set up. And this is not atypical from an online course. You know, we just throw a question up there and say, go, right? But if you think about your campus discussion, you'd be watching how people are interacting, right? Are you seeing a bunch of confused looks on their faces? Do you need to give them another prompt, something else to engage them with the content? Um, so there are a lot of different ways that we can really build discussions more effectively. Now that doesn't mean that a faculty member should be jumping in there all the time, because we actually have statistics that show that heavy faculty engagement in a discussion can, always, can also kind of shut that discussion down because the students are waiting for the faculty member to speak up. And they're a little worried about saying something that they shouldn't or having the opposite pos position of the faculty member. One of our faculty here, um, was actually asked, so what's your opinion? And she said, I'll tell you after, right? I'll tell you after all of you have discussed it. Yeah. Quick question. Yeah. So is the faculty to be a moderator in a different sense? Yes, definitely. So how can that be possible in a pre-recorded environment? So, or am I to assume that I'm understanding this thing whole in a different way and thinking that this is not a pre-recorded session? Exactly. So it, if it's a kind of your typical Canvas discussion board where you're popping that question up there, they're supposed to start answering at the beginning of the week, right? After they read or whatever. Um, so that's there and static, but a faculty member might jump in and say, okay, how about this? You know, or one student responds, you jump in and you say, that's a really great point. How about if we looked at it this way? And continuing that conversation to get them to try and dig deeper. If you're thinking about ahead of time, like we said, planning ahead, you're thinking ahead of what are those discussion issues. You know, if you've had this discussion in a classroom where you had a bunch of students in front of you, what were the points that those students brought up that you could help direct that conversation as well if they're not really getting it? Because each group of students is going to be a little bit different. Maybe the way you worded it last semester worked great, but this semester you're hearing crickets. 
nobody's responding. Maybe they're not making the connection that you want them to make. So you do need to jump in there and, and prod them a little bit. Okay. One thing that we suggest is that you don't allow them to wait until the last five minutes. That you have some sort of midweek or midday, if you're teaching a three-week intercession course, midday point at which they have to do their first response. And then they have a requirement for how many responses they have to do to other students. Yeah. Is there a study that shows how eager they are to discuss on a recorded environment or a written environment versus an open discussion in a classroom without anything being recorded? Gotcha. So I would have to look through my research to see if I have anything that specifically addresses that. I definitely have information that you are going to get um, respond well because you're requiring it you're going you're more likely to get responses from all students um, because those that don't feel comfortable speaking up in a class or in, in a, a physical environment will speak up in a more anonymous online environment um, so I'd have to look through to see if we have any direct um, correlation their names would be showing, yeah. So it's not necessarily for a lot of students in an online or in a campus environment. It's not so much the anonymity as the um, introversion or I'm not sure I'm right or I'm going to wait to see what other people say, you know, those kinds of things um, that can be an issue. Yeah. A real limiting factor is typing skills. Yes, absolutely. So we, I actually have an example of a faculty member who anonymously opened up one of those polls where um, students were asked to type in a question or a response and then everybody's response was going to pop up there, right? That one of the students had dyslexia. And so he had no confidence in his ability to type an answer and put it up there in that time crunched environment. So he felt very excluded. You know, so there's a lot of different factors. So yes, typing ability is definitely a concern, but if you're giving them a length of time to get that work done in an online environment, they've, they have the confidence to work through that. They all, there are also ways that you can have them do a voice recording. Right in Canvas, there's a little button they can push. You give the, them the instructions on how to do it. They can put a video up. They can just record their audio, those kinds of things. And then they don't have to type every time. You know, introductions by video. How much more fun would that be to actually see the face? Now, dealing with some are choosing to do online because of the anonymity. You will have students who have protection orders that do not want their face seen, that may be under an anonymous name for a certain purpose. And so you may need to deal with those students and give them an option of how they could um, you know, present themselves. That's one reason the one teacher does the kitchen environment rather than the individual, right? That doesn't really give anything away. Yeah. Random uh, kind of discussion board question is, um, is there neither data or advice from professors that have done this in terms of minimum and maximum amount allowed per post? Because I could see students saying really good things but going on so long that other students are like, I'm not going to read this. Pages scrolling through content. Yeah, um, I don't know that there is any specific. It's going to be you know, specific to the content and, you know, you might write more for history or philosophy than you would for something else, you know, those kinds of things. Um, certainly looking at um, reducing your group sizes, doing small groups for discussions is a really good thing to consider so that students are interacting with five or six others rather than 20, 30, 40, depending on the size of your class. Um, and then they're just reading those four or five responses, right, instead of the entire class, which goes on and on. 
the reality is that we have to face is it's unlikely in a 40 to 50 uh, you know, student environment that your students are actually going to read everything. They're going to post their post, read a couple, respond to their two, and be done. It's, it's time management for them, right? And the reality is, too, that's really hard for you all to read everything and respond to everything. So one other thing that we recommend is that faculty member certainly keep involved in that discussion. And there's a way you can show engagement is do a little bit of a summary at the end of the discussion saying, you know, this person, I really like their point. Great discussion on this, you know, pulling out a few pieces of the discussion that shows your engagement in the content. You actually were in there, you were reading, you were watching how they were interacting. And then maybe the next time, make sure you're picking two other students to call out and congratulate, say they did a good job. The students pick up on that. They definitely note when you say something positive about them in front of, in an online environment, in front of the entire class. That is going to help them feel more engaged. Great. Yeah. So we teach product design and interior architecture. Okay. So it's a little bit different than history or veterinary school or something like that. So it requires a lot of round table discussions, brainstorming, mm -hmm. and actually being involved in the drawing, sketching, ideation, and development mm -hmm. processes. So how can it be possible in a discussion environment like this? Okay, so you may have an environment in which not all of your content can really be asynchronous. Not all online content has to be asynchronous. It's okay to bring groups together at specific times and set those meetings up in a time that works for all students and that you can interact through Zoom, through, there's a couple of tools in Canvas, um, using, you know, whiteboard interactive tools in Canvas so that they're seeing problem solving, you know, those kinds of things. Do your office hours and problem solve with a group of students. Um, like you were saying, do that round table with a group on Zoom. Um, you know, yes, many students are expecting everything to be asynchronous. So if it's important for your content that it be synchronous, when you're listing the course, say, we will have synchronous meetings every Tuesday at 7 p.m. You know, so that when they enroll in the class, it's right there. They see that. That's going to be a requirement of the class. Okay. Now, if you can be flexible, you can set up those meetings after class starts you may indicate, okay, we are going to have synchronous meetings, so be prepared to find some times that are going to work. And maybe you do two sessions per week, one in a morning and one in an afternoon or something that works for students, right? So you find the, what works for those students. But just because it's online doesn't mean it has to be asynchronous. Great question. Anything else? Okay. All right, this is the number of students online as of 2018. So that's bigger, <coughs> right? Actually, I think it's 2017 is the most recent, I checked with my husband. This is the most recent statistics that we have, 2017. 6.6 .6 million students are taking at least one online course. That's only grown. So that's 33% of all students in a higher education environment. So we're probably all going to be teaching online in the next few years, right? In some form or capacity. So being prepared for that, knowing what you don't like about the classes that you've taken online and what you could do better, and how you can engage those students is pretty important to look at. Make sure. So this is one of my favorite quotes. Get where I can read it here. Classrooms don't need tech geeks who can teach. We need teaching geeks who can use tech. And that goes for campus classrooms 
hybrid classrooms, online classrooms. You know, we, it's not about the tech. It's about the teaching. It's about the pedagogy. It's about what you want students to learn. We're just trying to figure out different ways to bring that knowledge to students in an online environment. You know, it's possible and still traditional to have a 50 minute lecture, right? But how many of you look around and you see some people fading and you start pointing out questions, you know, or you do a quick quiz or something like that. So we need to think of different ways to engage the students, breaking up the content into smaller chunks, you know, in, you know, popping little quizzes in or doing assignments a little bit differently. Maybe you don't do the final that's worth 50% of their grade. Maybe you're doing different projects along the way that can help them really show their learning, not just their memorizing skills. So one of the things that we've definitely learned, and I'm gonna come back to that, is that 77% of the faculty in that study that I cited at the beginning feel that creating and teaching online has improved their teaching on campus as well. <clears throat> They're thinking about engagement of students more deeply. They're using active learning techniques more frequently, and they're really communicating better with their students. So an opportunity to teach online really can help you become a better teacher across the board. Now, a great way to succeed is to partner with an instructional designer. We have a few across campus, depending on the college that you're in, you may have one available. If you're teaching through Global Campus, Trina, who is my partner over there, and I are available to work with you. And there are multiple, multiple resources online, different trainings on teaching online. We have an online essentials class that you're welcome to complete as well. Right now it's just in the summer, but we may be offering it during the semesters as well. And by partnering up and working with your colleagues who also teach online and um, professionals in the online environment, if you will, we can really create quality courses and create that support network so you don't feel like you're alone on the island the same way sometimes online students feel. So we want to offer that to all of you. There are numerous studies out there across the board that show that there is no significant difference in outcomes for on-campus courses and online courses if they are designed well with strong engagement. There is a caveat there. You can throw materials online and they won't be good courses. But if we are building them well and we're really thinking about the engagement with the students, matching our materials to the outcomes that we want them to achieve, there really is no significant difference. And there should be multiple resources in my presentation that can show you that information as well. Any other questions? Yeah. So let's say I'm planning uh, to teach an online class and I don't, at this point, like I don't know what's possible, what's available. Is that where I can contact you and ask, like I, I would love, something I come up with in my mind, right? Like what if I build it this way? Is that when you can help to set it up if it's possible, if not, then yeah, kind of like absolutely. work out different ways and everything. Yeah, Trina and I love having conversations about online teaching. We love it, love it, love it. I get so excited and I'm bouncing off the walls and all of that. So we're happy to just bounce ideas around. Mm -hmm. um, we're happy to talk about sort of the basic structure of Canvas, mm -hmm. you know, and what you need to kind of get yourself off the ground. Um, we have lots of training materials that are available that are kind of self-paced for you to go through and kind of consider best practices in teaching online, um, well beyond what I could do in just a short presentation here. Um, so yeah, I would be happy to have Is you. there any, um, like an online chatting is available? Like if I would like to 
chat at the same time, like with students or something, let's say. Uh, Canvas has a chat feature. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you always can, um, you know, pull in Zoom if you want, you know, actual face-to-face mm -hmm. -face kind of things, but there is a chat feature in Canvas. Thank you. But you can also use a lot of different social media tools. There are a lot of different tools out there that you could consider, okay. and, and they, they have those features as well. So I don't have to just stay within Canvas, right? Like, like you said. I yeah, there that. are other tools that integrate into Canvas. Some of them you just post a link to the tool. You know, there's lots of different. Okay. Thank you. Another one here. <laughs> um, I am interested in taking the online class that you guys are offering this summer. There is any way that we can register or where we can. I heard about a friend of the, about that class from a yeah. friend of mine. So it's but a non-credit course, just to make sure everybody understands. Um, if you want the not credit or the credit course, go see no. Ben. <laughs> no, I just. But um, yeah, absolutely. I can give you my business card at the end of this um, and, and just send me a quick email with your contact information. I'll let you know when it's offered again. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I had a question about student development and the, so I went to the 2025 vision and a lot of it is about the focusing of the student's well-being and the development of the student as a whole. And with this online community, a lot of my time with, for that with students is like the five minutes before class or the five minutes after class, I can hear the discussion and be aware of where I need to point my students, maybe some places that I hear needs being, have you, any suggestions of how to build the community to where we are as instructors able to pick up on our students well being and development and provide resources in that way. So it's a little tricky in some of the well being pieces because um, it's you don't necessarily want to encourage students to be posting personal information in the online environment right. But if it's a, a concern about class content. One thing that I encourage faculty to do is have sort of a centralized location for questions about class and direct students that everybody should post questions there and answer each other's questions there, right? So it's not necessarily all on you to answer all of the questions, but in terms of course content, you can start to see the trends of where multiple students aren't understanding you know, a content area. Um, but the, the social issues that we often pick up in the classroom are a little bit more challenging in the online environment, definitely. Um, you want to make sure that you have expressed a welcoming, you know, openness to the students to come and talk to you, that if they are working or if they know of a student that has issues, they're welcome to come and talk to you about that student, that kind of thing. And so that can be a lot about how you communicate your own introduction and, and how you set that up. Yeah. Oh. So I can um, give some, what I do and that's to help with the social emotional component of addressing teaching and learning, especially with, I teach a course uh, with seniors and my online students are taking many classes at the same time and very, very stressful. Their senior years and many of them are experiencing things that I'm sure that many of you know, some really difficult things happen to our students during the course of the semester. So I do regular check-ins where I just say, and it's a required assignment, they have to post not to, not post, but they reply to me. And I just say, how are things going in the class? What questions do you have? Is everything okay? Do you, you know, then I say, sometimes I ask them to share something good. And then I see, you know, always say, let me know if there's something else you need. And so I do that a few times during the semester. Of course, it's private and confidential. Then I respond to everyone and they don't, you know, and I say, if nothing is, then you just say, all is good. And that's good. That's nice to hear that students are doing well also. And so I get all sorts of nice comments about the, you know, back from them, you know, funny things that are going on in their life, what's making them happy to balance that, you know, thinking about, you know, what we know about the research on gratitude as well. And um, yeah, and then just check in about course on a regular basis. Is, yeah, that's a great I point. do that. Thanks, Gary. Yeah. Laura, I have a question from one of our Zoom okay. members. Let's, let's have this okay. gentleman, because he's been waiting. No? Okay, okay, go ahead. 
Um, so the question is, uh, can you speak to how to measure if a student is a student of concern? Since it's not possible to see them in class, how can we gauge when a student needs to be intervened with? That's a great question. Um, so Canvas has some tools and we're implementing some more types of things from um, the different tools that we're just now adopting with K-State and the new uh, systems. Um, but you can definitely see you're going to have students that aren't interacting. You're going to have students that aren't completing assignments and that should red, raise a red flag for you. Now, the, uh, the reality is sometimes there's only so much we can do for those students if they're not physically showing up in our physical classroom or in our online classroom. But alerting student life to any concerns that you hear is certainly important and applies to the online environment as well. So um, reaching out personally, kind of similarly to what Carrie was saying, sending emails. Um, if you have the opportunity to get an, a phone number for them, because you can ask for kind of a biography from them at the beginning, uh, asking for where they're from and you know, maybe a phone number if you, so that you can reach out, those kinds of things. Maybe their personal email address instead of their K-State email address. Um, you know, and so there are ways that you can take that extra step to reach out to the students um, the same way you might if you have a student that just kind of disappears in the middle of the semester, you know. Um, but you will occasionally have students that never show up in an online environment and never log in. And, and so um, we have some methods at Global Campus of trying to reach out to those students at the beginning of the semester. And your different colleges may have policies about um, dropping those students if they've never engaged in the content. But then there are a lot of faculty that feel these are adults and therefore it's their responsibility. They've made that financial commitment. They need to take on that responsibility as well. So there are a lot of different philosophies about that. Can you grab the mic? Yeah, okay. Um, sort of in well, following up to sort of what you're saying here, is there any, um, do we have any uh, statistics in terms of uh, the number of students who just stop doing the work and never turn in the work in the online environment versus the classroom environment? Because I, I teach five classes a semester online and I have, I feel like a proportionately larger group of people per class who just give up or whatever throughout. And I have to try to convey that to uh, in the annual evaluation process of the classes. And I feel like it's, it feels to me like it's a higher uh, percentage of students than, than in the classroom, but, but I don't know, is, is that true? I'd have to look at the figures, but yes, completion rates on online classes tends to be lower than for campus courses. Um, there's unfortunately a little bit less accountability you know, if, you're, if your friend is going to class, you're more likely to go to class too. But if you don't, haven't connected with anyone in the online class, it's harder for you to feel accountable to that group. So setting it up in a, in a good way and checking in with those students um, can help with that. But yes, that is a statistic that exists. The population of the, the online students may be more um, I don't think that the population themselves is more at risk. Um, if anything, I think that our at risk populations shy away from online more. Um, it's the majority of the online population is adult learners who are going back to school either to complete their degree or start a degree. And so their issue becomes more too many responsibilities than an unwillingness to take responsibility. Um, and they, it becomes the thing that gets pushed off their plate. That's very often what happens. Yeah. Do you still want to ask your question? <laughs> we keep. <laughs> uh. The intellectual property rights. So this can go both ways. So I'm thinking about the negative scenario here, which is we usually think out loud as designers. So sometimes whatever comes out doesn't necessarily connect 
to the actual idea or maybe sometimes way off. Mm -hmm. Could be offending, could be off the chart, could be unrelated. I don't know, could be many different things. And this is kind of like being recorded in a discuss discussion session or <clears throat> another medium. So how much responsible are we going to be with those as faculty? That's one thing. The second thing is about, about the rights again. So I shared a course. It's a pre-recorded course. I've got slides. I've got examples. I'm discussing about stuff. And someone just goes online, just videotapes it, and starts using me, just getting my picture out of the slideshow, getting my name out of the slideshow. How does it work? How does it come back and haunt them, if it does? Mm -hmm. Okay, so really you're talking about two different things there. Um, so uh, the first really you need to consider the way you've set up the course from the beginning, the communication that you have with your group of students about what's okay and what's not okay. You know, we, we call it netiquette, you know, network etiquette, you know, in terms of what we're writing, but it sounds like in your environment, it's also what we're saying, what we're writing on the board, you know, those kinds of things. Images that you share. Images that you share. So, yeah, so really stressing copyright that each person owns the content that they create in your course. That is their content and no one else in the course should use it without their permission, right? And you can ask, you know, I'd love to build off of this, those kinds of things. Um, in terms of copyright and intellectual property within um, your content in an online environment, um, Canvas has some lockdown features so that students can't necessarily download your video content if you put that up there. You're right, they could videotape with their phone, you know, or screen capture or something like that. And it, it, it's potentially um, could happen. And so you would you know, pursue it similarly as you would if a student were videotaping you in the back of the classroom, you know, or, or as long as you have documented within your Canvas records, you know, we can show that that's your content, that it was your creation, and you'd have to pursue it through through the um, legal system. So it's being recorded. Mm -hmm. Does it give a right to have the rights of that? Video presentation or whatever? So you need to check with your particular college and your contract and everything like that. Um, with Global Campus, if you receive a grant from us to develop a course, it's a shared property. So it would, be, it would be yours to take with you if you left the university, but it's also ours to continue using at K-State. Um, but each professor and contract may be slightly different, so I can't speak to each individually. Awesome discussions. Anything else? Thank you all so much for coming. Please do not hesitate to contact us at any time if you have questions or want to learn more. All right, so thank you all so much for being here today. If you are trying to earn the credit for the uh, TLC Professional Development Certificate, please make sure that you signed in on your way into today's session. We're going to use that list to send out a post-event survey. Uh, the post-event surveys are also located on our Canvas page. It's the same survey that we have you fill out for every single event this year. We just make sure that you specify which event that you were trying to earn credit for. Uh, that should be coming out in the coming days, so be sure to keep an eye out on that in your email. Uh, otherwise, thank you again for being here today, and please help me in thanking Laura one last time. <laughs>